Uh, Dr. Shreya, you can please share your uh, screen. Shreya, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just, I'm not sure how to share it. Just, yeah, yeah I can hear you. Um, 
So just move your cursor on the screen, then you will see a green button below. Yeah, so some large record contents. Yeah, so just a sec. She has logged out. Are you having any problem? Please let us know. Share screen option. I know. You can mail us the presentation if you want. What is happening, man? Uh, if you just move your cursor on your screen, you'll have a share screen option below. Yeah, yeah, I know, but it's just, uh, I don't know, it's nothing is coming. I'm not sure why. Yes. Uh, share screen, but yeah, okay, I think so. Is this the one? No, launch meeting soon. Okay, let me see if this is how it works. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's this, uh, but how do I get the... Do you have, uh, can you open your presentation uh, window? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I have opened it. But... Yeah, now you can just uh, play play button. This one. Play. Where is this? Where is it? Which one yeah. is it? So this one, yeah. Uh, just below the reconstruction of tongue defects, that uh, orange button. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. So, welcome to Mahamana case discussion series. And uh, we are nearing the second year anniversary of our Mahamana case discussion series. And uh, the next, uh, the, the last session of this year on 28th of December, we'll be marking the second year anniversary. And we invite you all for a grand session on. Oral cancers that day. And for today's session, we have Dr. Shreya Bhattacharya with us, who will be speaking on reconstruction of tongue defects. And I'll introduce the other speakers after the talk. So I'll request Dr. Shreya to please make a presentation on reconstruction of tongue defects. She's a consultant head and neck surgeon at Narayana Super Specialty Hospital, Kolkata. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Uh, yes, and I'll request everyone, please, uh, others to please uh, mute their uh, uh, microphone. Yeah, sorry for the initial delay somehow. I was not able to. So is my screen visible now? Uh, yes. <laughs> you right. may proceed. Yeah.
Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, so my name is Dr. Shreya. I'm here to speak a little bit about reconstruction of tongue defects. Uh, so we all know that uh, tongue cancers are the most common, uh, one of the most common cancers in the Indian subcontinent. Curative intent treatment entails surgical removal of parts of the tongue, which we commonly call as glossectomy. So malignant tumors of the tongue can involve the oral tongue, that is the anterior two-third, the base tongue, the posterior one-third, or both the parts. The demarcating line is the circumvallate papillae. Now, uh, when we talk about tongue recon, there are certain essential functional considerations we have to take into account. So the tip and the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, they contribute to speech by articulating with the other sides, like your palate, the teeth, the buccal mucosa, the lips, uh, for uh, glossodental articulation. With regards to swallowing, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is responsible for the oral phase of swallowing. The bulk of the base of the tongue is essential to uh, for the pharyngeal phase where you propel the food bolus back into the pharynx. So functional reconstruction of the tongue is essentially a balance between uh, optimizing the volume replacement and ensuring tongue mobility. Volume so that, you know, you get enough bulk to propel the food back and achieve palatal contact and mobility so that the oral phase of swallowing and the articulation is maintained. Uh, okay, so uh, and various glossectomy defect classifications are published in the literature. This is our paper, which was published in 2021 in dysphagia. So we have classified glossectomy into uh, via two, uh, you know, in via two variables. One is the volume of the defect. I like to say that this volume of the defect is generally what we use in our general conversations, like partial, hemi, subtotal, or total glossectomies. Uh, so by volume, class one is less than one one third of the defect, which we commonly refer to as partial glossectomy. Class two is one third to half of the tongue, that is your hemiglossectomy. Class three is half to two thirds subtotal, and class four is total. Uh, the second component of our glossecti uh, glossectomy classification was the site uh, specifications. So lateral defect is isolated lateral uh, tongue resections. Tip. So we have defined our tip when the resection uh, exceeds anterior to the attachment of the frenulum of the frenulum lingue, and sulcus defect, or commonly what we call as floor of mouth defect. That is when you resect the uh, resection involves uh, the the mouth and the resultant defect leaves only less than one centimeter of front fringe mucosa on the mandible, or when it entails a marginal mandibulectomy. Uh, the other classifications, uh, few other classifications, one is uh, this one, uh, this, this is, uh, I think, uh, published in Surgical Oncology Journal in 2018 by Manelli and others. Here they have uh, classified the tongue defects on the basics of the missing anatomical subunits. So this is type one, which is a uh, marginal defect. It does not cross the midline and it does not go posteriorly. Type two is where Again, anterior two-third defect, the entire anterior two-third unilateral, does not cross in the midline or going posteriorly. This is type three, which crosses the midline, type four, which goes to the base tongue, and type five is any defect with uh, associated floor of mouth involvement. Uh, one more is there, yeah. This is uh, by Ansaran and others. This was published in Head Neck 2019. Here they have classified the tongue defects uh, based on the patterns of spread of cancer. So this is uh, type 1, which is what commonly known as mucosectomy, where only the uh, mucosa and submucosa are resected in the specimen. Uh, type two is uh, gloss. Uh, type two is known as partial glossectomy, where the mucosa, submucosa, and the intrinsic muscles are involved. Uh, type three has two components: type three A and type three B. Type three A is hemiglossectomy, where you have uh, the mucosa, the submucosa, the intrinsic, and the extrinsic muscles. And type three B is compartmental glossectomy where they, you take the full thickness unilaterally. Uh, type 4A again is uh, your uh, where you take the entire anterior two-thirds of the trunk. They've labeled it as subtotal glossectomy. And uh, type 
uh, type 4B, it, uh, apart from that, it involves the contral uh, ipsilateral base tongue. This is uh, labeled as neural total glossectomy. And lastly, is type 5, where the entire tongue is resected or the total glossectomy. Uh, yeah. So I think essentially further on, we will keep it simple and we will use this classification, but generally also we talk about low, that is namely partial, hemi, subtotal, and total glossectomy. Right. Um, Right. Now, so when we resect, uh, reconstruct the tongue, there are certain site-specific considerations which we should take into account. Like I said, the tip of the tongue, uh, it is important for glossodental articulation for speech. So it is important to reconstruct the shape of the tip to get the protuberant tip and as well as the mobility. Sometimes we can functionally, structurally reconstruct the, uh, reconstruct the tip. But if the tip is tethered, there will be difficulty in articulation. So very important to restore the shape as well as the mobility. So something we can see in the picture here. Then when we talk about floor of mouth, so when the resection ex uh, extends into the floor of mouth, it is very, very important to reconstruct the floor of mouth as well, along with the tongue defect. Very important to form that sulcus. So whenever we plan a flap in these cases, we should take the width of the flap to be a little excess than what is required so that we can get the gutter or the sulcus which is required for the recon. So again, like I said, this is very much important to maintain the mobility of the tongue and especially crucial for the oral phase of swallowing. Mm, yeah, now subtotal or total glossectomy defects. These are the defects where you need to restore bulk. Uh, like we said that when more than two thirds of the tongue were, you know, or the total tongue is resected. So we need to restore the tongue volume. That is very important. We need to ensure dental contact means the height of the flap when you reconstruct in such cases should be above the level of the Teeth. So that is very important, like we can see in the picture here. And then also very important to have a palatal contact. Important to avoid insensate gutters. What does that mean? That the flap shape should be convex rather than concave. It should be like a dome-shaped flap. And also another point to remember, like or more often than not, these subtotal or total glossectomy will have concomitant full thickness floor of mouth resections. So in those cases, we have to reconstruct the oral diaphragm. So this we have to do a multi-layer closure. For example, if we are taking an ALT flap, we take it with the muscle and the vastus muscle, which hitch it to the mandible to form an oral uh, diaphragm. And also important to obliterate the suprahyoid dead space, because this is where the muscle fits and in case we don't do that this area heals and the your fasciocutaneous part of the flap will shrink down uh, another important aspect for these bulky tongue defects is overcorrection. So when you see long-term uh, follow-up of these flaps, 11 to studies have reported 11 to 44% shrinkage. As you can see, this is an ALT flap and how much it has shrunk. So uh, the factors responsible are majority, not majority, almost all these patients receive post-operated radiation. And also studies have shown that Flaps which have muscle component, which is more often than not used in these kind of defects for multi-layer closure, they shrink more after radiation. So very important to overcorrect. So you need a dome-shaped flap. There should not be asensate gutters. It should have palatal and dental contact. You have to overcorrect it. You have to recreate the oral diaphragm and you have to obliterate the suprahyoid dead space. Uh, then, uh, yeah. Then uh, mm -hmm. now we are in 2023, we all know that free flap forms the standard of care when we talk about tongue recon. Uh, the most, I've just talked briefly about the most commonly used flaps. So in my practice, what I use majority cases are radial forearm free flaps and anterolateral thigh. So the advantages of radial forearm free flap is that it's a very thin pliable, very thin pliable fasciocutaneous flap, ideal for our hemiglossectomies and sometimes subtotal glossectomy defects. Uh, it has a long vascular pedicle, has a large caliber. So technically the anastomosis we can say is easier. It uh, You can harvest it with the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve and uh, it uh, provides for sensory re -innovation. 
Sometimes, like I said, uh, if there is no full thickness floor of mouth defect, you can use the radial forearm for type three defects also. But in those cases, we take we do a beaver tail modification where we take additional soft tissue, adipose tissue around it to increase its bulk. The problem with radial forearm is primarily the donor side morbidity in young patients, female patients who want their donor sites to be hidden. That it's probably not a good option. Uh, then anterior lateral thigh flap. Uh, like I said, we get enough bulk with it. Very important. You can take a composite flap with the concomitant vast vastus lateralis muscle. Uh, minimal donor side morbidity. You take. You can take large amount of tissue, and still the donor side is amenable to primary closure. Uh, yeah, and sometimes when we take and we need a balance of mobility and bulk, like probably an a subtotal defect, a subtotal rosectomy defect with a floor of mouth component. So we need a bulk for the tongue loss, but we need a uh, gutter. We need a flyable flap for the floor of mouth. So this flap allows for subcutaneous thinning. One centimeter around the ALT perforator, you can thin the subcutaneous flap to achieve a balance between the two. Disadvantages, yeah, sometimes there are absence of perforators. Compared to a radial forearm, probably when you have to do a perforated dissection, it's a bit technically difficult, uh, excessive bulky, in, depending on the patient's body habitus, uh, and a short pedicle. Short pedicle, there are ways to, if you put take an elliptical skin paddle and all, we can circumvent it. But the problem is that if you do want to take these flaps in a salvage case, taking the pedicle to the contralateral neck becomes, sometimes becomes a problem for ALT. Uh, then local regional flaps, uh, yeah, they do have a place presently also uh, where in uh, patients with comorbidities who have uh, contraindications to free tissue transfer or can be used for salvage option after free flap failure. <laughs> Advantages, we all know shorter operated times, the oncosurgeon itself, you don't need a plastic surgery backup. And uh, yeah, it's technically easier probably, but one caveat for local flaps, not local regional, but local flaps like, you know, submental, infrahyoid, that if it is a recurrent case and the patient has undergone a previous neck dissection, then we have to be very wary of doing this flap because the vascular supply may be compromised. Uh, another commonly used local flap, local regional flap, regional flap, what we use for total tongue defects is pectoralis major myocutaneous flap. We have all used it, major, majorly we use it in salvage settings. Uh, but one thing like what we, when, when I spoke about this uh, shrinkage, when we talk about long-term results, it is maximally seen in pectoralis major because it's a muscular pedicle. The gravity itself pulls the flap down. The loss of flap volume is significant as compared to VLT. And also like you lose a salvage option uh, if you do it as the primary option. So these are the things. Uh, yeah, so what I've spoken about just now, uh, like I said, class one, or I'll, I'll use the term partial glossectomy for our, in our practice, I don't recon these cases, I do not uh, do any reconstruction, either leave it for secondary intent uh, granulating, uh, leave it for granulation, granulating on its own, or in few cases we do primary closure. So when we are doing primary closure, we have to be very sure, very careful with, that we do not count uh, the distortion of the tip. There should not be any tip rotation when we are doing primary closure for partial glossectomy defects. When we leave the defects to heal uh, by itself, I generally ligate the lingual artery in the neck. Uh, then talking about hemiglossectomy that I said, like maybe half to two thirds of the tongue, various plethora of options are available. Uh, so here the goal is that we need a thin pliable fasciocutaneous flap. Commonly used flap is radial forearm. It's an excellent flap. Like I said, if you have a sulcus, if you have a floor of the mouth defect also so that you can get that, uh, you know, you can give, make that sulcus so that uh, the swallowing is facilitated. Lateral arm is another good option. Anastomosis, the, the venous anastomosis in lateral arm is a bit technically challenging. The advantage of lateral arm is that it has a lot of uh, adequate uh, subcutaneous tissue. So in those cases, like hemi defects, but without floor of mouth defects, it's a very good uh, flap for tissue replacement. Uh, other options are there. You can use anterolateral also in a boy, in a patient with thin body habit habitus or patient who doesn't want a, you know, who or who wants a concealed donor site. Uh, even a ALT is fine. Then local uh, options options which we use commonly is submental flap. 
uh, infrahyoid, uh, eye-landed nasolabial, eye-landed tunneled uh, facial artery myomucosal, even supraclavicular flaps I've used. And now the recent thing which has come is the perforator, not recent, but yeah, perforator flaps. Uh, then uh, again, class three, four, bulky defects. The aim is, like I said, volume replacement. You need a concave flap, no gutters, overcorrection, palatal and dental contact. So ALT, mo mo uh, majority cases we take with muscle composite flaps, then rectus abdominis, gracilis gastromental. I have seen it in my parent institute and uh, pectoralis major mainly for salvage purposes. Right, a little bit about perforative base flaps. So these came into being again mainly for these uh, type two or the what you call the hemiglossectomy defects, where you require thin pliable uh, tissue. So how do you define a reliable perforator flap? You want the perforator at least a good single perforator, visible pulsation, diameter more than five millimeter, consistent vascular supply. Problem is, of course, requires a lot of expertise, technically demanding, especially the nastromosis of it. So these are the commonly used perforator flaps. Uh, among these, what I have used personally is the ALT perforator. We don't plan it to be an ALT perforator. We raise it and then we see that it's not going into the main vessel and we take it with the perforator. So ALT perforator, then uh, thoracodorsal artery perforator, middle surreal artery perforator, peroneal artery perforator flaps. Um, so apart from, so till now what we have discussed for recon is the dimensions or whatever, the specification of the defect. The other factors also we have to take into consideration, the patient factors, important is the patient habitus. Obese patients tend to have bulky flaps when you take it from the thigh, the chest or the uh, abdomen. And uh, that is one thing. Uh, then uh, patient preference. So what happens when these flaps are bulky? It's difficult to insect, especially if it's a paroral resection, difficult to insect. And of course, gives uh, a bad aesthetic outcome. Uh, preference and occupation, like I said, young patients, female patients, they uh, female, they might want concealed donor sites, so radial pura may not be a good choice. Then even local flaps, like submental or infrahyoid, where your neck scars are visible, again, may not be good options. Comorbidities, severe comorbidities preclude the use of a uh, uh, microvascular flap, so you want to do a rapid harvest, so local, local and lower regional flaps are good options. Uh, local tissue laxity in elderly patients, you know, with multiple comorbidities, they might have a lot of lax tissue anyway. So local flap is a good option in these. But in males, we have to be careful about hairy skin, like the submental, the beard area, the nasolabial, etc. Uh, another important fact is recurrent cases who have already been operated or already been radiated. You don't have, you have a dearth of uh, uh, this thing, uh, recipient vessels. Uh, so it's a vessel depleted neck, fibrous neck. So again, in these cases, you can do, you cannot do local flaps. Also, probably the only option requires either that uh, remaining is that you do a free flap and you, with a long pedicle and you anastomose it to the contralateral vessels. Uh, what comes to my mind is radial forearm and even this our uh, thoracodorsal uh, perforator flap also has a long pedicle. ALT probably is a bit dicey in these cases and. Uh, a pectoralis major is always, uh, is always there. If you are planning a microvascular flap, it's good to do a preoperative angiography to know the vessel status. Mm, yeah, so re-innovation. Re innovation basically started with the goal of sensory improvement. So basically, you re innovate the flap. Like, for example, if you're taking a radial forearm flap, you take it with the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve and you coapt it to the lingual nerve. So various studies have been published. Uh, there have been uh, conflicting uh, results also. So this, this is an Italian study where they found that sensate radial forearm flap, it pro improved tactile discrimination. There was no return to test taste function, but improved tactile discrimination. Similar results have been uh, reported in other studies, which especially for, you know, this is pertinent for total or subtotal uh, glossectomy defects because the pharyngeal phase of swallowing is affected. So in these cases, if you have a sensate flap and the tactile discrimination is improved, probably it can uh, lead to uh, significantly improved uh, speech uh, I mean, functional outcomes. Uh, another study, this is by Mandri, this is a Californian study. Here they, uh, before also they had done, this is a uh, 
till now we are talking about sensory innovation this is motor innovation with where they have uh, used the motorized gracilis and uh, an astromost it to the hypoglossal nerve so what they found with uh, with the uh, this thing study that these neo tongues they could not demonstrate any autologous movement so whatever tongue movement was there it was because of the associated pharyngeal movements so they have hypothetical hypothesized that this may be that uh, there's a chance of muscle atrophy while the reinnervation happens uh then a bit about functional outcomes uh, speech so uh, when you do a literature review we said that majority of the patients like uh, studies have say more than have reported more than 80% of the patients where uh, who were reconstructed with uh, free flaps went on to develop intel intelligible speech so this is one uh, matsui and others they compared speech outcomes among 126 patients so they were divided uh, of the flap which they have compared are radial forearm pectoralis major and rectus abdominis flap and they found that patients reconstructed with, uh, with radial forearm had better articulatory functions but again the confounding factor here is that the patients who were uh, reconstructed with radial forearm would definitely have a smaller glossectomy defect so probably it's not it's not a hetero homogeneous sort of group for comparison mm -hmm. then this is one of the biggest review by lam and others this is published in 2013 actually so uh, they also reported good intelligible intelligibility in tongue patients who were reconstructed with uh, microvascular recon and but they found that they uh, the outcomes were worse for patients who had a concomitant base tongue uh, resection uh our paper also same thing our study we found the same thing that the incremental volume as the volume of the tongue defect increased the it was associated with worse speech outcomes tip resection resection of the tip affected the phonatory alteration similarly base resection as seen in lamb's review we also found that base resection had speech alterations uh so multiple studies including ours found that larger tumors resection including the tongue tip and post operative radiotherapy negatively affected speech uh this is a head to head com comparison between radial forearm and alt flap this is a spanish study ha huh. here they found there was no significant difference in outcomes between radial forearm and alt so uh, the authors concluded that since alt has less donor side uh, morbidity probably it's a superior option so when you do a literature review you find articles supporting each and everything so there is no definitive evidence suggesting that one type of flap has superior speech outcomes compared with another there is also no definite evidence to suggest that reinnervated flap has better speech uh for swallowing this is our study here we found that majority of the patients you know they were uh, having near normal this is functional oral intake scale near normal uh, for a uh, poi scale and uh, more than 85% had achieved rails tube independence that is poi score a uh, four or above same similar to speech we also found that advanced t stage incremental volume of glossectomy defect and adjuvant rt correlated with abnormality of swallowing parameters uh then this was a multivariate analysis what we did and we found for the oral phase of swallowing the independent predictor was the volume of the defect whereas for pharyngeal phase of swallowing adjuvant radiation was found to be the independent predictor uh again we we look at lamb's uh, systematic review for swallowing they found that uh, regardless of the flap type majority of patients they return to a pre operative swallow parameters by one year time post operatively however manrick and others reported in patients who had concomitant tongue and base tongue resection 14% still demonstrated aspiration on one year follow so again studies have compared flaps based on post operative swallow no significant benefit of a particular flap over other types have ever consistently been demonstrated right uh, so yeah just to conclude like what i said glossectomy defects are less than one third which we commonly know uh, no uh, call as partial glossectomy options are primary closure and no no re or no reconstruction we can let it to granulate if we are opting for granulation please ligate the lingual artery in the neck just to reduce the chance of hemorrhage 
then we have the hemiglossectomy. We need a thin plyeval fasciocutaneous flap. Options are radial forearm, good if it has a pleural mouth defect, lateral arm for isolated lateral defects, and other various other uh, local flap options like we discussed. Then subtotal again and total, we need flap with bulk. We need to have volume replacement. We need glossopalatal, uh, sorry, palatal dental contact, and we need bulk to propel the foot backwards. So these are the various options like we discussed. Thank you. So thank you, Shreya. Thanks a lot for the wonderful lecture. And um, we will now proceed uh, with the case presentation. And for case presentation, we have Dr. Labdi Nirmal. He is a resident at uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And uh, as examples, we have Dr. Krishna Kumar Hankapa. He is a professor of head neck surgery at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. Dr. Krishna Pa. He is a professor and head at Tibet Memorial Institute of Oncology, Bangalore. And Dr. Elizabeth Matthew Hyde. She is a professor of head neck surgery at uh, RCC through Endram. Uh, do we have everyone? Uh, uh, Krishna Kumar sir, he is there. I think he. Uh, good evening, Dr. Elizabeth here. Yeah, yes, ma welcome, ma'am. Uh, good evening. I am Krishna Pa from Bangalore. Yeah. Yeah, welcome, sir. Yeah. Hello, hello, sir. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. let's start. Okay, Lapti, you can please start. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, Today, I'm going to be presenting a case on oral cavity, uh, CA tongue. So starting with the history, uh, my patient is a 50-year-old male, resident of Delhi, taxi driver by occupation. He presented to our OPD with chief complaints of non-healing ulcer over the lower aspect of the tongue on the left side since four months and pain over the lesion radiating to the left ear since two months. The patient was asymptomatic four months back when he noticed an ulcer over the lower aspect of the tongue on the left side, which was insidious in onset, initially pea-sized to begin with, and which gradually progressed over a period of four months to attain the present size. It was associated with pain radiating to the left ear, which was aggravated on chewing and relieved with painkillers. There was a history of excessive salivation. There was a history of foul smell from the mouth. There was a history of speech, chewing, and swallowing difficulty. Uh, he complained of worsening of pain. There was no history of change in voice. There was no history of decreased mouth opening. There was no history of bleeding from the lesion. There was no history of any loosening of teeth. There was no history of any neck swelling. And no history of any other ulcer or masses elsewhere in the oral cavity. Uh, Patient uh, gave history of tobacco consumption. He was a tobacco chewer daily, approximately two pouches of uh, 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 tobacco uh, since 12 years, uh, reformed since three months. He also gave history of cigarette smoking, two to three cigarettes per week since 12 years, reformed since three months. There was no history of alcohol consumption. There was no history of dentures or sharp teeth. Uh, there was no history of weight loss. No history of difficulty breathing, cough, or any bloodstained sputum. No history of any bone pain or chest pain. Patient did not give any history of any treatment taken elsewhere for the presenting complaints. There was no significant family history. The patient is a known diabetic on oral hypoglycemic agents since 8 years. There was no history of any other comorbidity or surgery. To summarize on the history, my patient is a 50-year-old male, known diabetic, known tobacco consumer recently reformed with a non-healing ulcer over the ventral surface of the left side of the tongue associated with pain radiating to the ear since four months. Okay, uh, that'd be nicely presented. So to discuss about the history, uh, 
you were telling the chief complaint of the patient is uh, the lesion, the, I mean, the growth itself with pain, right? Yes, sir. And you said it is uh, uh, radiating to the right ear. Yes, sir. So how will you explain this? So how will you explain this? What is probably happening? How can you account for that pain and how is it radiating to the left, uh, right ear? The, the uh, pain is because of involvement of the lingual nerve um, and it is radiating uh, to the ear because of the uh, innervation via the uh, uh, mandibular nerve, the lingual nerve and uh, the um, auricular, auric auricular temporal branch. Uh, the efferent is, uh, the afferent is formed by the lingual nerve and the efferent is the auricular temporal branch which supplies the anterior uh, uh, EAC uh, and the anterior part of the tympanic membrane. Okay, so 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 why does the why does the patient feel it in the ear? Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm asking. So, what is the mechanism? There is. You have explained the nerve supply of the tongue and the nerve supply of the ear. So what? Yes, sir. So involvement of the lingual nerve. Uh, it, is uh, causing radiation of the pain to the um, auricular temporal branch. Okay, so it's uh, probably can be ex explained by the shared innervation of these two areas. Okay, shared yes. innervation of these two areas. Okay, so from yes. uh, the patient is having pain from the tongue and he feels it in the cortex, probably recognizes it uh, or misinterprets it for coming from the ear because of the shared innervation. Okay. That's all. We have to explain it. And you said uh, there is a decreased mouth opening. How, how can that happen no. in a tongue? So I no mean, there is no mouth opening. I, I mean, why do you why do you want to think about that? How can the mouth opening be affected by uh, tongue cancer? Actually, a um, uh, patient can because he is giving history of tobacco consumption. So mm -hmm. there can be uh, oral submucous fibrosis that can be concomitantly present uh, with the. Uh, uh, um. So you said oral submucous fibrosis can be a reason for decreased how mouth opening. Yes, sir. Correct. And also pain can be one of the reasons uh, for a decreased mouth opening in advanced cancers, especially. How? How? How exactly in advanced cancers? How? How the mouth opening is getting affected by a tongue cancer? The involvement of the floor of mouth can have difficulty, and very rarely uh, the involvement of medial pterygoid uh, in very advanced uh, cancers can cause uh, pain while opening the mouth. Otherwise, yeah. most um, more, mostly it can it will be uh, submucous fibrosis only. Submucous fibrosis, yeah. right? And any other cause? Can pain cause reduce reduction in the mouth opening? Can pain yes, cause sir. reduction in the mouth opening? Yes, sir. How? Oh. Mm. Can result in spasm of the masticatory muscles, okay? Yes. So that can result in pain. Submucous fibrosis, you are telling it can result in reduction in the mouth opening. How can, how, how is that happening? What is the relationship between submucous fibrosis and the mouth opening? So there are fibrous bands that form uh, at the level of uh, the anterior pillar and uh, uh, the uh, pterygomaxillary raphe. So that causes... So how, is that, how, how is that happening? How does this uh, fibromuscular bands occur due to submucous fibrosis? What is the pathophysiology? Uh, uh, there is uh, a stimulation of the fibroblasts uh, and uh, uh, deposition of fibrin. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay. The stimulated fibrosis. Okay. All right. May I to, uh, read a little more about that me me mechanism of uh, uh, pathophysiology of uh, uh, submucous fibrosis? What is the role of copper in um, submucous fibrosis? Okay, last question about the thing. Uh, tobacco and cigarette smoking, you told, right? Yes. 
so how is that what are the how can it cause this thing uh so sir tobacco is a uh, a class 1 carcinogen it's a known carcinogen mm -hmm. uh, so it causes uh, 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 defects in dna repair and uh, uh, leading to uh, it, it increases the uh, metabolic activation and it causes uh, uh, dna adducts uh, uh, which lead to mutation in various uh, genes the p53 the ras the rb gene uh, the mic gene um leading to uh, 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 decreased apoptosis uh, increased angiogenesis and increased transformation in the cells okay, leading nice. to and, and proliferation of uh, good answer what is nicotine the nicotine is the uh, compound which uh, what is nicotine and it cause cancer so nicotine uh, is uh, yes so it is one of the active compounds in uh, tobacco which causes so nicotine is a carcinogen that's what you are saying right are you no it's not a no, correct sir. nicotine it's a polycyclic a aromatic hydrocarbons yes sir yes sir no nicotine is not a carcinogen okay it's only a uh, addictive uh, like uh, agent yes so when they are using it as a component of smoking they tend to use it more and the other component of the smoke actually causes cancer elizabeth yes. manner please carry on yeah uh, lapti what are the uh, you said about smokeless tobacco yes. what are the contents in that quid so uh ma'am the chemical compounds that are uh, so it's no, no, the no. polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons so what are the components what are the things which they use as smokeless tobacco which they used to keep it in the mouth do you know yes. the local uh, beetle quid a uh, beetle yeah. quid no uh, 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 they call it gutka chutta khani a uh, beetle hmm. quid with um, um, arecanut so it also. will have uh, yeah arecanut tobacco leaves lime yes. okay yes so uh, do you know the function of each just because we started with this ma'am it has irritant effect of lime yeah arecanut is a chronic irritant cause irritation and cause yes, uh, as you said that uh, cause for this uh, submucous fibrosis and uh, uh, fibrotic changes and then tobacco yes. you said it contains carcinogens what is the role of lime ma'am it Clink -clink. Clink -clink. alkalinity uh, of which uh, uh, promotes the absorption of uh, all these compounds yes it decreases the ph and uh, increases the solubility of this carcinogen so that's why uh, most of our patients use this and keep it in the mouth or in the gb sulcus area even while sleeping so that's why in the indian subcontinent it is more common in the gb sulcus area and uh, what is the role of alcohol in carcinogenesis you said about tobacco the cigarette smoking and the smokeless tobacco the role of alcohol ma'am uh, uh, again it it is a solvent so it uh, uh, enhances the absorption it has a synergistic effect with uh, tobacco so it enhances the absorption uh, also the aldehydes are uh, uh, known are known uh, uh, probable carcinogens uh, then uh, okay so what is your relative risk for a smoker compared to a non smoker for an oral cancer incidence so for an active uh, for tobacco for an active tobacco user uh, the odds ratio is around 6 uh, for uh... yes and for alcohol it is seven times and uh, both together it is about 37 times okay that's what the literature says so that much synergistic effect is there and in the history you almost clear covered everything you said about family history what is the importance of asking family history for an oral cancer patient what all uh, congenital problems or syndromes associated with oral cancer increase incidence ma'am there are uh, uh, there's blooms there is uh, uh, ataxia then there is uh, fanconi anemia 
then uh, dyskeratosis congenita. These are some of the uh, syndromes which can help. Yeah. Other things, you, anything you missed in the history, the occupation of the patient is taxi driver. Driver. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that occupational exposure is also important. Okay. Yes. For any of head and neck malignancy, some of the chemicals, painters, uh, woodworkers, all those things, the occupational hazard is also there. You have to ask about that one. And any other thing you missed in the history, something related to HPV, you have to yes. always ask about the high risk features high risk for the patient. Behavior. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like multi sexuality, extra parental affairs. Um, okay. Abnormal sexual behavior. All those things has to be asked during the history taking to exclude HPV related malignancy. Yes. yes. So, can you just summarize the history and according to the history, what could be the diagnosis? So, ma'am, my patient is a 50 year old male, known diabetic and a known tobacco consumer who is recently transformed with a non healing ulcer over the ventral surface uh, on the left side of the tongue, associated with a pain radiating to the ear, uh, most likely a, a malignant ulcer uh, over the tongue. Okay. Now proceed. Examination. Yes, ma'am. Uh, coming to the general examination, the patient is conscious, cooperative, oriented. He's averagely built and nourished. And the ECOG performance status is zero. Uh, vitals are stable. The patient is afebrile. Pulse is 84 beats per minute. Blood pressure and uh, respiratory rate are normal. There's no pallor, ictris, cyanosis, clubbing, edema, or generalized lymphadenopathy. Uh, moving on to the local examination. On inspection, the mouth opening is adequate. inter incisor distance is 3.5 centimeter. The patient is dentate. He has poor orodental hygiene and tobacco stained teeth. Uh, tongue movements are partially reduced. Um, the uh, He has a single approximately 2.5 by 1.5 centimeter ulcer proliferative lesion over the ventral surface of the tongue on the left side at the level of the lower premolars and the first molar. Uh, uh, the edges are everted. Anteriorly, it is approximately 2 centimeter away from the tip. Inferiorly, it involves the floor of mouth. Laterally, it is away from the line of abutment. Posteriorly, the circumvalid papillae, anterior pillar, tonsils, RMT, base of tongue appear free. Medially, approximately 5 mm from the midline. There are no other lesions seen. Uh, on palpation, the inspectory findings are confirmed. Uh, the uh, induration is palpated beyond the visible growth uh, in, and is just short of the midline. There are no loose teeth. The rest of the oral cavity, no other lesion is seen or palpated. The skin is free. On Hopkins examination, bilateral cords are mobile. Everything else is clear. There is no other lesion seen. Coming to examination of the neck, uh, on inspection, there are no visible swelling, scars or sinuses. The skin is normal. On palpation, a left level 1B sub-centimeter heart tender mobile node is palpated. And a left level 2, 1 centimeter approximately, Hard tender mobile node is palpated. Overlying skin is normal. Uh, coming to the systemic examination, the chest is clear. Air entry is bilaterally equal. Uh, normal vesicular breath sounds and no adventitious, no adventitious sounds are heard. The cardiovascular system and um, uh, nerve system examination are normal. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Please summarize the findings and probably give your diagnosis. Yes, sir. So to summarize, my patient is a 50-year-old male, known diabetic and tobacco consumer, now reformed, with a 2.5 by 1.5 centimeter non-healing ulcer over the ventral surface of the left side of the tongue, involving the floor of mouth with referred otalgia, with left level 1B and 2 node uh, palpable, most likely a malignant neoplasm of the left ventral surface of the tongue, uh, clinically T2 and 2B. But I would like to support my uh, clinical staging with uh, uh, cross-sectional imaging. Can you go back to the neck examination finding? Yes, ma'am. What are things you examined? The scars, sinuses, swellings, and the lymph nodes. Yes, you didn't examine about your carotid, thyroid, laryngeal framework. 
all these things you missed the neck examination is complete only after your thyroid examination bilateral carotids and the laryngeal framework so for all head and neck examination has to be completed so yeah and what about the thyroid examination yes ma'am the thyroid examination was normal there were no nodes palpable the laryngeal framework was normal um, bilateral carotid pulses could be felt that should be complete okay the neck examination yes. and system examination you said uh, also mention about the lower cranial nerves which is associated because it's a tongue cancer what are cranial nerves specifically you examine ma'am specifically the hypoglossal nerve only uh, for a tongue patient um um near the so for your you have to mention all these things like cranial nerves even if it is normal you have to mention about that means you have examined the nerves okay yes. so for a tongue cancer you said um, hypoglossal nerve any other yes. nerves associated with oral cancer what about paresthesia over the chin what nerve is involved mam for paresthesia uh, over the skin the mental nerve involvement so the inferior alveolar nerve involvement uh, can lead to paresthesia over the chin okay so in oral cancer you have to check for gag reflex also what all nerves are associated with it mam uh, the glossopharyngeal uh, nerve uh, primarily for the gag reflex yeah and also the accessory nerve has to be examined so basically uh, for fifth then seventh and 9 uh, 10 11 12 12 has to be mentioned okay yes sir so did you say there is some restriction in the mobility of the tongue yes sir what could be the reason for that uh, so restriction in the mobility of the tongue could be because of involvement of the floor of mouth uh, it could be because of the involvement of extrinsic muscles of the tongue uh, and it could also be because of the pain because of lingual nerve involvement lingual or hypoglossal nerve involvement Okay. What are the extrinsic muscles of the tongue? Uh, so the genioglossus, the hyoglossus, the styloglossus, and the uh, yes, sir. Genioglossus, styloglossus, hyoglossus. The geniohyoid. Geniohyoid. Yes. All right. So what is the staging in this case? Uh, so uh, I would like to assess the depth of invasion um, before. Okay, uh, clinical stage. Clinical. Stage. Clinically, so it is a T two um, uh, N two B disease. Why do you say it is T two? So it's a two point five by one point five centimeter lesion approximately. Mm -hmm. uh, I could not assess the depth of invasion since it's a floor of mouth uh, and ventral surface tongue uh, uh, lesion. Mm -hmm. uh, So just based on the dimensions, uh, it appears to be a, a clinically T2 lesion. And nodal, nodal staging? Uh, sir, I could palpate uh, the uh, le left level one B and level two nodes, uh, which were hard, tender, and mobile. So, um, uh, so it it will come at N2 B. Uh, sure. In which all malignancy? In which all oral cancers? Subsides, you can assess the depth of invasion clinically. Ma'am, if it's a superficial tongue uh, 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 cancer, then it can be uh, lesions that are pinchable uh, can be yeah. easily assessed for depth of invasion. By by digital examination, you by can assess. Examination. Okay, yes, that's possible in early cancers. And what about buccal mucosa? um uh, buccal mucosa cancers ma'am if it's an early cancer uh, it may be possible to yeah uh, only for tongue and buccal mucosa for pinchable lesions you will be able to do by by digital examination the clinical assessment of the depth of invasion not for uh, alveolar or palatal lesion okay yes ma'am so how is the depth uh, related to the staging What is the uh, significance of depth as depth assessment in staging? Um, uh, so, uh, uh, so depth of invasion has been found to be um, uh, uh, a significant prognostic factor uh, mm -hmm. by the ICOR paper by Brymey et al., uh, which was incorporated in the 
AJCC staging, wherein uh, less than uh, five mm depth of invasion was uh, stage one, uh, five to uh, one centimeter depth of invasion stage two, and more than one centimeter depth of invasion uh, becomes uh, uh, sorry T three and upwards for stage three. Right. So what what is happening when the depth of the tumor increases? How is the prognosis worse than? What is probably the explanation for the worsening of prognosis for a deeper tumor? Hello? Yes. Sir. How is depth of invasion related to the prognosis? So um, uh, there can be a uh, uh, spread of the tumor through the uh, perineural uh, and perivascular uh, tissues spread to what 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 sort of spread is there any uh, correlation with the lymph node involvement yes sir yes sir so uh, uh, with increasing depth of invasion uh, the uh, lymph uh, lymph node metastasis the rate of lymph node metastasis increases somebody has worked on it uh, very early in the literature for all the cancer. Can you uh, talk about that evidence? Depth versus nodal involvement. Depth and nodal involvement. No problem. I think it's Spiro. All right. Yeah, uh, Spiro's paper uh, defined it as less than two, two to eight, and more than eight. And then he has classified the nodal metastasis accordingly. And even Dr. Jatin Shah has a paper on depth of invasion related to the nodal metastasis. So what's the difference between tumor thickness and depth of invasion? Uh, Ma'am, tumor thickness uh, varies for, uh, from the depth of invasion in the sense that tumor thickness is the overall bulk of the tumor, which can be uh, more than the depth of invasion uh, when it comes to exophytic growth and uh, less than the depth of invasion when it comes to uh, endophytic or ulcerative in uh, invasive uh, uh, growth. So the uh, uh, tumor thickness is the entire bulk of the tumor. Uh, and uh, uh, versus the depth of invasion is measured from the uh, uh, basement membrane of the surrounding uh, uh, normal junctional tissue towards the point of uh, uh, maximum inv invasiveness. Yeah, the deepmost part of the tumor, that's the plump line from the plump line. Yes, yeah, basement yes, membrane towards the deepermost part of the Okay. Dr. And... Krishna, is there? Hey. Yeah. Yes, sir, I'm there, sir. Good. Oh, okay. So, what next? How do you work up this case? Next. So, uh, I would like to perform cross-sectional imaging for this patient uh, and uh, uh, metastatic workup uh, along with um, uh, a biopsy uh, to prove, uh, to get the diagnosis and uh, routine uh, blood investigations and labs. What cross-sectional imaging do you want to do? So for a tongue uh, lesion, I would like to do an um, uh, a contrast enhanced uh, MRI of the PNF neck, uh, and for the distant metastatic workup, I would like to do an NCCT thorax. Why do you prefer a CT scan? What is the purpose of doing this contrast enhanced uh, uh, imaging? In this case. Uh, so so. Uh, uh, Contrast enhanced MRI, so it will help us uh, uh, see, uh, decide, uh, study the site, the extent, uh, the uh, uh, the depth of invasion. It mm -hmm. can also help us uh, uh, see the nodal status. Uh, it can help us assess uh, any if there is any perineural invasion or any base tongue involvement or floor of mouth involvement. So you said you are uh, planning to plan our uh, section accordingly. You said you are doing an MRI, right? MRI yes. or CT? MRI, sir. Okay. What is that? What are the advantages of MRI over CT scan? So for tongue lesions, uh, uh, MRI gives a better anatomical uh, uh, characterization uh, than a CT scan. Mm -hmm. Then what else? Any other so, reason you so, already? 
involvement of the nerve yes sir perineural mm -hmm. invasion can be better studied on mri right. so basically the depth of invasion the extent of the tumor you can plan for your reconstruction and again the perineural spread the nodal disease all these things can be assessed by the or cross sectional mm -hmm. imaging so you said yeah. routinely you are doing ct chest for all these cases uh, yes ma'am what are the indications of advising a ct chest for these patients this is t2 n2 b yeah uh, yes ma'am uh, so um, for your t2 n2 b disease because of the nodal status uh, then uh, the uh, staging of the tumor the location of the tumor so i would like to uh, look for if the patient has any distant metastasis also the habits of the patient so you no, said the you level are... lymph nodes are level 1a 1b is only your palpating there is yes. no lymph nodes at a level 4 or level 5 why do you want to do chest x chest ct madam is asking ct sir so there are any and no i was just asking because it may not be feasible in every institute to go for a ct chest for a all or oral cavity cases maybe an x ray chest is also enough because of our high volume centers it may not be possible or feasible to do ct chest for a, every patient maybe as his sir was saying maybe the lower neck node patients or very advanced disease you can go for ct chest otherwise even a plain chest x ray is enough to rule out mets or uh, pulmonary tb or the lung function all these can be assessed by a simple chest x ray that's what i was saying. so if you have the facility and if the patient is affordable definitely you can go for a ct chest but it's not really indicated in some cases so lebtu what are you specifically looking in the uh, ct chest uh, so if there are any uh, metastatic nodes or any other uh, any other conditions in the lung uh, condition like like yeah, three, three, tuberculosis any there is three per oh, okay so there is tuberculosis anything else patient is a chronic smoker then so or chronic smoker so any second primary uh, uh, in the in the lung second primary any 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 signs of copd okay any or signs of copd or any metastatic disease. this is a purpose but uh, as dr elizabeth was saying may not be that important in uh, such a uh, i mean early comparatively early stage tumor and because of the you know uh, the constraints due to the resources that was the point okay uh, so what is second primary cancer uh so second primary uh, tumor is uh, uh when there is a, so there can be a, a synchronous or metachronous uh, tumors uh mm -hmm. is, asynchronous tumors are uh, when there uh, the tumor is uh, within uh, two months of uh, uh, the diagnosis of the index tumor and metachronous is when the time lapse of uh, more than six months uh, elapses between uh, the diagnosis of the tumor okay and who gave the criteria for the second primary how do how did they define it uh so uh, warren and gates gave the criteria uh wherein uh, the both the tumor should be malignant they should be uh, separated by uh, 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 normal mucosa at least 2 uh, cm and uh, uh, the the second primary should be uh, uh, should not be metastasis of the index tumor okay uh, so you said uh, at least 2 cm there is one one criteria is that the uh, the two lesions should be distinct okay so distinct, yes. one, one is the uh, separation by the distance what is other distinctness criteria the time the temporal relations okay so there is it should be at least uh, uh, three or five there are different papers talking about three years or five years like clear yes about the distinctness part it should be distinct in terms of the spatial spatially distinct as well as temporally distinct that is one criteria and both the lesions should be malignant and one should not be metastatic of the other so that is varan and great 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 what is the second field tumor uh 
the second field tumor uh, <laughs> no problem i think yeah, we can little bit read about uh, second field yes. tumor and uh, uh, all the molecular changes and the tumor pathogenesis of uh, thing what is a uh, uh, slaughter's theory the uh, field cancerization uh, mm -hmm. when the exposure of the uh, carcinogen is to a widespread area uh, like in oral cavity so there can be multiple point mutations uh, occurring simultaneously uh, across the uh, exposed surface which can undergo malignant transformation in uh, uh, at any given point of time so what's so the incidence second, of getting second primary per year in any upper ear digestive tract malignancy per year, what is the incidence? I'm, I'm around uh, three to four percent uh, per year, and uh, cumulative incidence over the lifetime would be around uh, twenty-five to forty percent. So that so I think uh, second, second, uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So second, second primary one, is the commonest, um, second. Uh, commonest cause of failure in any early oral cancer treatment. Okay, not local regional recurrence. Second primary incidence is the most commonest cause of uh, failure in early cancer of the oral cavity. So you said about biopsy in this case. Uh, what biopsy you take? Is it an office procedure? From where will you take the biopsy? Yes, ma'am. In uh, uh, superficial, well-seen uh, uh, lesions uh, with a good mouth opening, uh, we can take an office biopsy under uh, uh, local anesthesia. We can take a punch biopsy from the most representative area uh, uh, in the tumor. Okay. Do you routinely do an FNA from the lymph node? Uh, no, ma'am. We don't do an FNA from the lymph node. Okay. If it is clinically and radiologically significant, it could be metastasis from your primary. So you don't routinely go because of your constraints of the resources. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, some people routinely do FNA. What are the indications or why they do routine? Some of the Western centers, they do routinely FNA from the lymph nodes also. Any point in doing or... Uh, uh, maybe to plan the extent of uh, neck dissection. To rule out some coexisting lymphomas or any other pathology in the neck. Some people routinely do FNA from the neck nodes also. Okay. So regarding the neck nodes, my imaging, you have yes. ultrasound, CT scan, MRI. So yes, which one is best to detect model? So ultrasound is the best to detect, but it has a, uh, it is a very subjective evaluation. So uh, CT scan is a, a more objective evaluation for neck nodal metastasis. And CT and MRI are uh, comparable uh, when it comes to evaluation of neck nodal metastasis. So ultrasound guided FNA is the most specific thing when you are asked about the... Yes, uh, Yeah. Guided FNA. Okay, what are the radiological features of a significant node? Um, uh, the node, uh, the size of the node, it's more rounded, uh, enlarged. Uh, it can have central necrosis. Uh, then um, any extra nodal extension, infiltration into the surrounding tissues, irregular margins can be seen. So these are characteristics of a metastatic. So what is the nodal staging if it has an extra nodal spread according to the latest TNM? No, it becomes an N3B disease. Okay, N3B. And uh, what about the pathological staging in the PTNM? Uh, it becomes a, a PT2 uh, lesion, ma'am. Uh, T2, uh, T2A lesion. Uh, if there is a single micro metastatic, micro uh, uh, ENE, less than uh, 2 uh, mm. It's nodal, nodal yes, staging. Nodal. Yes, ma'am, nodal staging. Okay. Only what is micro and what is macro? Uh, ma'am, uh, external extension less than 2 mm uh, is micro and uh, more than 2 mm external extension is macro. Can external nodal extension 
assessed radiology be assessed radiologically uh so uh it can be assessed uh, if there is if there are irregular margins or if it's infiltrating into the surrounding soft tissue or uh, 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 so is there any description of uh, grading for this external or external tissue? Sorry, there is no. uh, yes so uh, there is a grading system uh, uh, there are uh, uh, this um who, who came out with the staging system the radiological ene uh, external extension uh, usually there are there are around three studies uh, uh, which have graded it as uh, a, a stage 1 2 2 and 3 where the first one is there's loss of uh, fat stranding uh then uh, there is a uh, uh, grade 2 i'm sorry i don't remember not sure grade 3 is uh, overt extension into the uh, soft tissues okay read about it i think uh, i think uh, there it was described by somebody else and it was uh, re discussed in a recent paper by abhishek mahajan from your institute i guess you can read that paper all right um so what are you going to do with this case if the biopsy so does come cell carcinoma yes sir uh, so um i would like to offer do we uh, have the uh, images with us yes sir yes i do have the images with me okay yes, can you go through it yes sir. what are you showing us uh, so this is the uh, coronal cross-sectional imaging uh, of uh, the uh, head and neck region. Uh, showing what? MRI. Cross-sectional MRI, yes. Sir. Contrast enhanced MRI. This is the uh, T1-weighted uh, imaging with contrast. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it is showing the uh, tumor tissue in this uh, cut uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, neurovascular bundle. Mm -hmm. which is seen here and uh, uh, we can see the mylohyoid sling we mm -hmm. can see the uh, diagastric the anterior belly of the diagastric we can see some probably uh, reactive nodal tissue uh, the lesion is seen uh, uh, infiltrating the hyoglossus muscle uh, the genioglossus appears uh, uh, free uh, it is also seen invading the uh, sublingual space. Okay. So what is paramandibular spread? Uh, can you go back to that image? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what is paramandibular spread? It can stay there. So we can also see the lymph node. Yes, sir. Uh, so paramandibular spread is uh, when um, the uh, tumor uh, uh, invades the line of abutment uh, with the mandible. So we would call it uh, paramandibular spread of the tumor uh, in this case. What is the relevance? Uh, so uh, 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 we can plan uh, the uh, excision. We might have to, uh, we will have to uh, counsel the patient regarding uh, segmental mandibulectomy when the line of abutment is involved for, um, uh, for margins. What is this also, line of abutment? It could, uh, also it could, so it is the uh, uh, level of the reflected floor of mouth mucosa on the mandible. All right. It's the line of abutment. So when okay. will you plan for marginal and when will you plan for segmental medical for a tongue malignancy? Uh, Ma'am, for tumors which are just uh, which are uh, away from the line of abutment but close to the line of abutment around 5 mm or so for adequacy of margins, uh, we can uh, plan a marginal mandibulectomy. But tumors which are uh, involving the line of abutment uh, with the gross paramandibular uh, spread of disease or the tumors which are invading the lingual plate, 
uh, they can be uh, planned for uh, segmental resection. So, with that, what are the contraindications in a case for marginal mandibular? Ma'am, uh, gross paramandibular disease will be a contraindication, hmm. plus uh, involvement of uh, 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 lingual plate uh, of the mandible. Yeah, that is, uh, that is anything which is oncologically unsafe. If there is a gross invasion of the bone, you avoid a marginal mandibulectomy. The other contraindication? If it's uh, if the patient has received uh, radiation before, so oh. then you, you would avoid a marginal mandibular. Uh, why in post RT cases you avoid marginal? Ma'am, the, there is no likelihood of developing osteoradionecrosis uh, if we okay. do a chance of ORN and also ORN. what happened in a post radiated mandible? How does it the can tumor be... spreads? It can spread from. Uh, it doesn't have any. Uh, 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 Root a fixed root of spread, it can spread uh, directly through the that barrier has lost there is a porous, breach yes, in the periosteum. Periosteum, so the, yes, yeah. The periosteal breach is there, so it can spread through any cortical defect. So that's why we are not uh, uh, having oncological safety in doing a marginal mandibulectomy in some of the post, especially in lower alveolar disease and all, not in tongue. So in a post-radiated case, in edentulous, in old, elderly, all these patients, these are relative contraindications for doing a marginal mandibulectomy in view of oncologically unsafeness or um, OR, okay, or pathological fracture. Uh, yes, so what, what should be the, uh, uh, the remnant mandibular, uh, what do you call that? At least one centimeter uh, yeah, remnant. One centimeter uh, remnant mandible should have to avoid a pathological fracture. fracture. Okay. So how will you assess the uh, uh, margin in a mandible actually? Will you be able to do a frozen section or uh, what are your clinical judgment operatively to assess the safe, safety margin? Ma'am, mm. uh, cross-sectional imaging can help us uh, assess the height of the mandible which is free from paramandibular disease and accordingly we can plan if we can go ahead with a marginal mandibulectomy or not. Uh, 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 apart from that, ma'am, uh, uh, frozen section cannot help us in uh, assessing the safety margin. Uh, yeah, your clinical judgment while doing a marginal or a segmental mandibulectomy, it should be a hemopoietic marrow. The marrow should not be replaced by your uh, tumor tissue. So that has yes. to be examined in the remnant mandibular segment, whether it is a hemopoietic marrow, fresh bleeding is there and all those things. If in doubt, okay. you can send the marrow scrapings Marrows. for frozen, frozen section. Tissue. Ideally, what should be the margin for soft tissue and for the bone? Ma'am, uh, for the soft tissue, ideally gross margin should be uh, one centimeter or more. A microscopic margin of uh, at least five uh, millimeter, and for bone also, ma'am, one centimeter uh, gross margin is always. When you say about the mucosal and soft tissue margin, it should be in an unstretched mucosa. Okay, unstretched. that's one yes, centimeter. If you are stretching it, maybe you have to extend it up to one point five to two centimeters. Okay, yes. so uh, pathologically, how will you say close margin, negative margin? Uh, what should Ma'am, negative margin is any margin which is more than 5 mm, uh, pathologically. Uh, uh, close margin is uh, less than 5 mm, and uh, uh, less than 1 mm would be uh, positive or uh, positive margin. Yes, ma'am. Involved margin. So, when Involved will margin. you ideally, yeah, when will you ideally do a re excision? When you plan for re excision, in which all instances from the margin? Ma'am, in close and positive margins, we will plan for re excision. Any other? Mm. Any feature of moderate to severe dysplasia at the margin? Yes, any, any dysplasia, a, so we will plan or, for... Early. Or in-situ changes at the margin. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So in this case, you have done a biopsy. You have done yes, imaging. Now how do you proceed? What is your plan? So... Uh, this uh, being a surgically resectable disease, uh, I would offer a curative intent to my patient and offer a surgery uh, to the patient. 
Uh, I would like to go ahead with, uh, since it's a, a lesion involving the ventral surface of the uh, tongue with uh, involvement of the floor of mouth, I would like to go ahead with a, a, a wide excision glossectomy via pull-through technique, uh, via visor incision and bilateral neck dissection, uh, bilateral selective neck dissection. Uh, send uh, uh, the uh, level 2A for frozen section and then decide on uh, uh, whether to go ahead with a comprehensive neck dissection. So ideally, when you are asked about the treatment of your patient, you have to say about the combined modality treatment in this case. Okay, yes. for an early lesion, always a single modality, either surgery or radiation. Okay, any oral cancer. And in late stages, stage three and four, according to you, the, what is the composite stage for this patient? In two uh, weeks? Uh, uh, this will actually, uh, the depth of invasion uh, on uh, imaging is 10.3 centimeters. So it becomes a T3 lesion. Ah. Uh, T3, uh, uh, more in than, no, yes, ma'am. So it end to be uh, disease. So the composite stages? Ma'am, stage uh, uh, 4A stage for it. So uh, for any case, when you are asked in advanced disease, it's a combined modality treatment. So yes, ideally indeed. in a tongue cancer, so when you answer it, you have to answer like this. It's a combined modality. So I'll go for surgery followed by adjuvant treatment. Adjuvant so treatment. even some examiners will prefer you telling them about the pre-op counseling, all those things about the habit cessation, about the rehabilitation procedures you counsel to the patient, all those things you have to explain when you answer then only yes. the examiner get the impression that you have a wider exposure to all the area. Okay, not just jump on to the surgical management, wide excision, neck section, and all those things. Yes, So in this case, the extrinsic muscles are involved. Yes, sir. And you are telling wide local excision. What type of glass activity you want to do? Uh, sir, I would like to do an anterior two-thirds glossectomy. Uh, in this case. So earlier you said wide local excision. Now you are telling what type? Uh, so it will be uh, type 4A vasectomy according to Manelli. So when you are counseling to the patient, you have to tell properly, no? Uh, wide local excision, is, especially if the tongue is a functional organ. Hmm? Yes. yes, sir. So you said bilateral neck dissection. Yes. So what are the indications for bilateral neck dissection here? So involvement of uh, the floor of mouth is an indication for uh, bilateral neck dissection and the lesion is approaching the midline. So You did not tell it the history or examination it is crossing the midline? So uh, I did mention on palpation, so it was, uh, in duration was reaching the midline, so. So in the scan, the it's a lateralized disease, right? Is it crossing midline or midline rapid? Anyway, contralateral neck, there are no nodes, right? N0? Uh, yes, ma'am. No palpable nodes, uh, but on the scan, some reactive nodes could be seen. Okay. Okay, so what, what are, are the indications the... to do contralateral neck dissection? Uh, One is the crossing so, the midline. Yes, sir. Crossing the mm -hmm. midline. Then uh, epsilateral neck, uh, uh, multi-level uh, nodal disease with extra nodal extension. Uh, high nodal burden, epsilateral neck, can be one of the indications for doing control, control lateral Last nodal uh, in the level 1B, you have to address the opposite side. Okay. Yes, sir. Then what percentage? Of the cases, there will be a count, contralateral neck nodes will be present. Uh, so Any papers you want to quote? Um, for contralateral neck, uh, there's a risk of around uh, 15 to 20 percent uh, contralateral neck metastasis. Correct. So, paper from TMH is there? Yes, for the yeah. Recurrent yes, thyroid can uh, recurrent tongue cancer. How much is the contralateral nodal incidence? 
okay yes, uh, along with your indications for contralateral no uh, the one name node positivity and also for the midline lesions yes ma'am okay bilateral floor of mouth tip of the tongue and midline lesions okay what is the approach for uh, glossectomy in this case uh ma'am uh, we can do a pull through glossectomy Uh, in this case, since the lesion is on the ventral surface of the tongue and it is involving the floor of mouth, mm -hmm. so the, for glossectomy, I would like to use the pull through approach. We can also do a uh, transmandibular. We can also do a transmandibular approach uh, or a mandibulotomy approach for um, excision of the lesion. Do you require a marginal mandibular to be here? Do you think? Ma'am, uh, clinically, uh, the uh, disease. I would like to do an um, evaluation under anesthesia uh, yeah. before uh, planning on uh, going ahead with the uh, marginal mandibulectomy. Uh, but uh, on clinical examination, the lesion was well away from the line of abutment, so uh, I would not uh, plan it. But I would sure. still like to assess before uh, the procedure. Yeah, this statement is really. Uh... uh actually you have to answer like this only for examination under anesthesia you have to examine maybe because of the pain and all patient may not be tolerating your uh examination in the opd so you have to examine under anesthesia to assess for your supple mucosa between the tumor and the mandibular periosteum so if it is within that 1 cm distance you have to go for marginal mandibulectomy for oncological safety margin so even without lip splitting a uh, trans mandibular approach maybe you will get it because patient has normal mouth opening right in this case yes. so only yes. if there is a difficult exposure you have to go for a lip splitting or trans mandibular approach so right here you have done a, almost like a hemiglossectomy marginal mandibulectomy bilateral neck dissection and uh, what about the closure Uh, ma'am for uh, uh, reconstruction uh, uh, region local local flap like a milo labial flap can be used or a, a regional flap like a pmmc flap can be used or free flaps can be used uh, i can give uh, depending on the resection um, i can offer the patient a, a free flap like a, a fraf or a, a anterolateral thigh flap okay So one so question maybe... on the neck dissection. Yes. So this is a N zero. Say for example yes. N zero. What do you want to do? So if it is an N zero neck, I would still uh, go ahead with um, ipsilateral neck dissection level uh, one to three. Uh, I would send a level two A for uh, uh, frozen section. Uh, the tongue lesions are known to have skip metastases. Uh, so. Uh, um, Uh, clearance of level one to four will give me uh, ninety six percent clearance. So why do you want to go for L, uh, level four? Ah, uh, sir, so because uh, there is evidence to suggest that uh, there are skip metastases in. Any tongue papers you want to quote? Uh, sir, for uh, skip metastases. Ah, uh, so initially, ah. Uh, this bias paper on uh, skip metastases that was the one of the initial papers uh, this jatin shah's paper uh, there's also uh... okay what is the incidence of skip mets in bias paper uh, ma'am approximately 30% yeah it was actually in a uh n plus neck he has quoted about around 15% for the level 4 so in n0 neck is it's much much less less than 5% okay so that's why uh, the level 5 and 2b need to be uh, cleared only if it is if there are positive nodes in level 2 or 3 so in such yes. instances you might have to go for a frozen section of level 3 and then go and clear as a comprehensive neck dissection okay in an n0 neck and especially if 2a is uh, normal maybe you can avoid an in uh, level 2b dissection also that is a paper from tmh 
they suggest that the outcomes are uh, comparable to uh, a lymph node dissection with uh, uh, a better functional outcomes uh, so uh, uh, sentinel uh, they have uh, uh, they have uh, found an occult metastasis rate of around 23% uh, roughly uh, so what is sentinel node biopsy the biopsy of the first echelon uh, echelon node is uh, sentinel node node biopsy the procedure mm -hmm. involves uh, injecting a uh, technetium 99 nano what, what is the first echelon node what is its importance first, the first draining node sir so okay. uh, so what is its significance so spread of the tumor would be more likely to uh, that node nodal metastasis would be most likely to that node Okay, so based on that, how are you designing your neck management? That is central node biopsy, right? So yes, what is the what is the concept? Uh, uh, so what is the concept the, of central? The uh, the uh, in in an N zero neck, uh, they mm -hmm. found only thirty percent necks had. Not the first. Anything? What is the concept? How do you explain the concept of sentinel node biopsy? Sentinel you said it's first sentinel node. node. That means lymph, lymph nodes. The nodal spread occurs first to that particular node. Yes. So what? What are you trying to do there? Did you understand my question? What is the concept? How is it better than a complete neck dissection? Hello. Yes, sir. So, uh... so in central node biopsy, we are meticulously examining, pathologically examining the first echelon node. Yes. Sir. If we could prove that particular node is negative. The concept is that the chances of the lower drainage becoming positive is very, very less. That is the concept. Okay. Yes. So yes. if we could prove near conclusively that node is negative, we can, we need not know a full neck dissection. Full neck. What is the purpose of not doing the full neck dissection? So to avoid the... Uh, what is the purpose? For better, for better function, sir. Uh, to reduce Correct. the morbidity. To avoid morbidity. morbidity. It's not that. Yes, sir. To reduce the morbidity. Sorry, morbidity, yes, sir. Okay, so that is a concept of central node biopsy. Yes, sir. Uh, right. So you talked about the evidence. What are the evidence in favor of central node biopsy in adenoid cancer, in oral cancer? Uh, so uh, there is there are uh, the landmark trials on central node biopsy are uh, uh, the CEN trial, the uh, the French study, and the Hasegawa Japanese study. Uh, so they are non-inferiority mm -hmm. trials and uh, they have shown uh, uh, that uh, 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 What do you mean by non-inferiority trial? So non-inferiority trials means they are not inferior to elective neck dissection although equivalence has not been established but mm -hmm. uh, they have a safety margin, uh, they keep a, a specific uh, predefined margin uh, which was around 10 to 12 percent in uh, these uh, trials so what is uh, is it good or bad? The ten percent, ten to twelve percent is good or bad? No, it's it's not good, sir. So what is be be best? What is the best? So equivalent, please, at least equivalent. No, no, what? No, no, what is what percentage of non inferiority margin is the best? Probably the best. You said 12, 20, 10 to twelve is not good. So how much it should have been? Oh, they should Clear? not. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Five percent, right? The typical 
uh, non inferiority margin for a good trial is 5% but they have kept it for 10 to 12 percent what could be the reason what could be the reason of keeping it high um, you're just asking you little tough question probably you are because you are answering everything so what what is the probable explanation of not keeping an ideal non-inferiority margin the recruitment accrual of patients ah is... correct so to the reduce the case. sample size yes to, to see the feasibility of the trial if we keep it low the study may not become feasible because of the large yes. sample yes. that's why they kept it uh high okay yes sir hey. right my friend medical oncologist want to give nact what is the role uh, sir, uh, uh, NACT has a role for tongue cancers. Uh, NACT has uh, shown to uh, uh, it is uh, in lesions which are involving uh, the uh, uh, sorry reaching the hyoid, very extensive lesions uh, reaching the hyoid. So there's role of um, NACT in these lesions. Um, so in borderline tumors, you. Borderline tumor, valicular involvement, posteriorly uh, lesions reaching up to the valicular uh, and uh, lesions uh, uh, which are reaching up to the hyoid, so borderline resectable diseases. So apart from this borderline so resectable tumors, uh, what about your organ preservation, like mandible preservation and according to the Lysitra trial, what percentage of mandible can be preserved? Uh, Ma'am, approximately... Uh, Twenty percent of no thirty five percent of cases uh, mandible could be preserved. So any trial from TMH? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, there's a there's an ongoing trial uh, on uh, uh, it, it. The phase two trial has uh, there's a phase three trial go, uh, going on on uh, mandibular preservation currently at TMH. Okay, so the main indication according to you for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy is borderline resectability and also borderline resectability uh, and, also and for mandible preservation. Mandible preservation. Okay. So, what did you do for this case? Sorry, what is the pathology report? Do we have the pathology report? Yes, sir, we have the biopsy report. So, we are yet to operate this patient. Okay. So what 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 particular uh, features are you looking in a pathology report? So in the pathology report, uh, I am looking at uh, uh, the primary diagnosis, uh, the uh, depth of invasion, uh, mm -hmm. the dimensions of the tumor, uh, mm -hmm. the pattern of invasion, mm -hmm. uh, the predominant and worse patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, then I am. What is uh, the importance of that pattern of invasion? So to prognosticate and to uh, 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 so how many grades are there? Worst pattern of invasion, and what there are, are five they? grades. There are five grades, ma'am. Uh, grade one is when there are pushing borders. Mm -hmm. uh, grade two is when there are cord-like projections. Uh, grade three is uh, when um, uh, more than fifteen uh, cell. Uh, there are uh, nodules of more than fifteen cells. Per uh, island. Per island, yeah. Uh, I sorry, tumor islands uh, comprising of more than uh, fifteen cells. Uh, grade four is when there are tumor islands uh, which are less than uh, fifteen cells, and grade uh, five is when there are uh, isolated uh, uh, satellite uh, nodules which are at least one millimeter away from the uh, index tumor. Less than one millimeter away. Less than one. Oh, that's the worst worst pattern worst. of invasion. Okay, what is the scoring system comprising all this worst pattern of invasion, PNI and all, LHR? Who proposed the scoring system? Uh, Ma'am, there's a Brandwin Gensler paper, histologic. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. 
Yeah, anyway, I think there are two, three scoring systems and one from India also. Aditi Nusrat Arora, so one paper is also there. So comprising all these for the nodal metastasis prognostication. Okay. What is this lymph no lymphoid host response? Three grades are there. You have any idea? LHR. Uh, I don't know about it, ma'am. Okay, you can read. What about PNI? You said about post of the final pathological. Yes, ma'am. Uh, PNI, uh, then lymphovascular emboli, PNI. No, what additional what additional uh, things you want to know from your pathologist about PNI? Whether it is intratumoral or uh, and focal or whether it is extensive. Intratumoral, extratumoral? Yes, or it is if it is involving more than one third of the circumference of the nerve and also which epineurium, perineurium or internurium which is involved, also the size of the nerve. Yes, ma'am. Macro or the... micro? Yes. Yes. Okay, less than one millimeter or more than one millimeter. It's a major nerve or a minor nerve. All this has to be explained by the pathologist while giving the final pathology report of PNI. So how will you decide on the adjuvant treatment? Uh, so... Uh... Uh, so in this case, say yes, for example, sir. is it T2, N0, M0? Yes, sir. T2, uh, you N0. You want to give adjuvant treatment? Uh, so, uh, T2, N0, M0 uh, uh, cases, so if there are no high risk features on pathology, uh, they can be offered observation also. Uh, my radiologist says I want to give radiotherapy. What are the risk features in T2, N0, M0 you want to give radiotherapy? Mm, so the uh, predominant and worst patterns of invasion, uh, whether there is... Um, uh, any perineural invasion. Okay. One is grade of the tumor. I grade. grade of the tumor. Yes, sir. high grade tumor. Yes. Perineural invasion. Yes, sir. What are the very? What is very high risk factor? Very high risk. How, what is defined as very high risk among these pathological factors? Have you heard of that? The lymph nodal status is the most. Uh... There is a definition for very high risk. What are the indications of con concurrent ke adjuvant chemo radiotherapy? Uh, so uh, positive margins and uh, uh, external external spread. extension. Okay. But there is also a paper to uh, suggest that uh, uh, multiple level nodes uh, can also be uh, a high nodal burden with multi level nodes. Correct. High nodal burden, more than six uh, nodes, is sometimes described as uh, very high risk for, and it's an indication for concurrent adjuvant chemo radiotherapy. So, what is the evidence for adjuvant uh, concurrent chemo radiotherapy? Adjuvant concurrent chemo radiotherapy. So there are there's the uh, trials by the EORTC and the RTOG group. Uh, the uh, Bernier Cooper papers uh, to uh, what is the Indian evidence? Your Tata paper, Tata evidence. Is there any paper uh -huh. talking about adjuvant? There is so. Uh, and what did that paper prove regarding the uh, regimen for uh, cisplatin? Uh, or do you so weekly weekly cisplatin versus three weekly cisplatin. Okay, so which is better? So, uh, weekly cisplatin of uh, is uh, better tolerated in our population. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, low toxicity is seen with the weekly cisplatin of forty mg per meter square dose uh, by the Indian so, population. What what dose was tested in the? 
Indian paper. What did it prove? What What is the conclusion of that paper? Maybe you can read that. What is our cat study? Uh, or cat study. Yes, sir. Mm. I think you're done. done. Um, she's doing. She has done fairly well. Uh, it's One, my last question. question. My yeah. last question. What is the role of brachytherapy in sea attack? Uh, so brachytherapy for a lung lesion has no role because uh, it is uh, for this case especially it's a deep seated tumor. Brachytherapy has a role in uh, superficial tumors which are not uh, which are away from the bone, like a lip uh, lesion or a buccal mucosa lesion, which is not uh, in in involving the uh, gingival buccal sulcus. Mm -hmm. But for a tongue lesion, uh, it's a, it's a mobile uh, uh, and dynamic structure. So uh, uh, it's plus, not... it's a deep seated uh, tumor, so it doesn't have a role. So the main disadvantage of giving brachy is you cannot address the neck. Right? Yes, ma'am. You are treating yes. only the primary disease. And when you have an uh, incidence of more than 20% of occult metastasis Five in the metastasis. neck, this is not really advisable. That's why it has limited role, especially in lip or uh, the verrucous lesions in the lip and all. Otherwise, it doesn't have much role in oral cavity cancer. So another question is, you said about the uh, final pathological margin. What is your... Uh, risk of uh, uh, recurrence or death if you have a positive or a closed margin for the tumor. That's also a TMH paper has proved it like patients with the tumor with positive margin has a 2.5 fold increase and also closed margin had a 1.5 fold increase in the risk of death. Paper by Pankaj. Pankaj, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so that is the importance of getting a negative margin as and the surgeon's prognostic factor. Okay, surgeon's role in the prognostication. Yes, sir. I think she has done well, but she has to read a lot. Yes, sir. So, Hi, yeah. sir. Okay, sir. Okay, so, Labdi, what are, what are the rehabilitate, uh, rehabilitation measures you advise in this patient post-op, post-RT case? Um, I'm speech and swallowing rehabilitation. Uh, uh, since it's going to be an anterior uh, two-third tongue defect, so the oral phase of swallowing is going to be affected. Uh, so, I would like to... Uh, um, offer maneuvers to enhance the oral phase uh, of swallowing, uh, like uh, neck extension, mm -hmm. uh, effortful swallow. Okay. Um, then uh, uh, a range of movement uh, exercises for the tongue uh, and uh, resistance uh, training. Okay. Resistance exercises. Mm -hmm. um, then, then again, speech therapy. And shoulder therapy. exercise. Shoulder exercises, yes, ma'am. Uh, any any prosthesis which helps in the swallowing rehab for a patient with a hemiglossectomy or a total glossectomy? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you said uh, in that uh, initial talk she was telling about the tongue has to touch the palate for the yes, oral phase of the swallowing to be initiated. So, in a, most of our cases after a hemiglossectomy and all, this won't happen. So, what the prosthodontist role here. There is something like a palatal drop prosthesis, which help in pushing the food backwards. Okay. Okay. So how will you follow up the patient? How frequently you have to follow up? Uh, the initial, uh, after completion of uh, uh, adjuvant treatment, uh, I would like to, in the first two years, I would like to follow up my patient every two to three months, uh, following which uh, for the next three years, 
uh, I would like to follow up my patient for uh, every six months. And after five years, I would like to follow up my patient yearly. So final question, what is the survival in, in this patient, five-year survival? Uh, around 50 to 55 percent, ma'am, in this patient. 50 stage four? Stage four? four. You have 50 percent? No, 35, 35 uh, yeah. to 40, 40 percent. Yeah. It's around 30 percent. Okay, good. You have answered well. Uh, thank you, Labdi. Thank you for the case presentation. Uh, thank, thank you, you Krishna, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar, Dr. Elizabeth, and Dr. Krishnappa. And uh, thank you, Shay, for the wonderful talk. Uh, we'll be meeting once again on 14th of uh, December and followed by the second anniversary celebrations on uh, 28th of December. So thank you once again for joining. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank everyone. you, sir. Thank, thank you, Sunaina. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.